Thank you. I feel as though I should be in the Jean-Paul Gaultier exhibition with this <laughs> rather strange contraption that I have to say is doing something to my neck. So if I go a bit weird, you know that it's this thing happening here. Um, just before you start, can you just quickly check audio? We forgot to check audio. Yep. I need to hear something from here. Oh, from my machine. Oh. I, well, I played something before well, and it was OK. okay. Well, yeah, I think it was OK, yes. I just thought I would show you a little bit about Perth, Western Australia, just so you can see that there is a city across that western part of Australia. And just for, as you can hear, I'm British. I moved to Australia six years ago. And Perth is the second most isolated city in the world. And uh, it, the, the land mass makes up approximately one third of the whole of Australia, Western Australia, but there are only 2.2 million people living in it. So there is some resemblance there with Canada, you know, this land, huge land mass and people just down on the border end of Canada. But of course, in Australia, they're just scraped around the edge because in the middle there, it's almost too hot to live. But um, the university is very beautiful and it's 100 years old and has this rather magnificent concert hall called the Winthrop Hall. And so that they have this funny thing where they name their professors Winthrop Professor to link them to the university. So it's just to show you where I've come from. Although I, so several people do know that I had um, studied at Laval J'avais fait la moitié d'une maîtrise en musique en chant il y a 26 ans. Alors, that makes me feel very old. So the overview of my talk. I'm going to give you a little bit about the context for this inquiry I've been engaged in now for some 25 years, in fact. Um, I'm going to look at what the key questions were that drove me and continue to drive me in this work and the reason for the specific approaches that I've adopted that will be, for some of you, quite different. And as I've just explained, I'm a singer. My background from uh, the very earliest engagement with music was as a performer. However, as an undergraduate student, I did go and join in social psychology classes at university. And then when I began uh, I actually finished my master's degree in London and when I was working there with someone who's a music psychologist called Eric Clark, I started to look at music cognition, however still within the framework of my own PhD studies and subsequently I've been very much driven by social concerns. So we'll, we'll come on to those as well. And then we'll look at some of the results I've uh, obtained over the years and try and assess what this, the value of the research has been for me as a process and perhaps talk about future explorations. And of course, that's something I'm very interested in talking about tomorrow with those of you who are there at the workshop. So um, without following that in too much detail, this is my sort of aid memoir. Of course, there's a growing uh, area of interest in body movement and um, as was pointed out, really, when I began my own PhD studies in 1986, there was nobody else at the time doing research in the area. So it was really asking those questions. What is it that I want to know? How can I engage with what my body is doing in performance to ask a, a series of questions? And of course, inevitably, one goes to what literature is there and there is an evident link with musical structure. It's obvious. You are generating the performance through your body. It's coming out and what indeed you are expressing as musical material. So a starting point is let's look at the link between musical structure and, and how we're uh, actually generating that performance through our body. Now that research has persisted and there have been some fantastic innovations with the advent of technology. Uh, technological developments and of course I was quite impeded in my early work by a lack of technology and I'll tell you some of the grim uh, weeks I spent um, measuring on a, a video screen but anyway um, and of course this research has persisted this link with musical structure and biomechanics and um, they seem to be the principal ways in which we're looking at 
expression and what the performer's doing and how they're generating this expressive performance as it's linked to structure and as it's linked to the assemblage of the body to generate that. But of course, for me, there's a very strong historical context and embedded in very strong socio-cultural practices and these need to be addressed. And we've got this very funny little picture here of Liszt, but Schumann, speaking of Liszt within their own particular context, says, he must be heard and seen, for if Liszt played behind a screen, a great deal of poetry would be lost. And in fact, at the time I was doing my own studies, I found some wonderful cartoons from Paris done um, by a Polish uh, cartoonist and they were showing you Liszt playing the piano and of course they're frozen images but they said things like St Francis of Assisi communes with the birds and here he is playing. So of course we've got a narrative link to what he was trying to communicate with these gestures. So there is a strong social story there and it's one that I um, have tried always to keep in my mind. So the key question as uh, we might uh, ask them. So how do biomechanical requirements, the actual nuts and bolts of playing, interface with a model of what we do in a musical performance? Well, the, my starting point I think here is I want to take um, the, the notion of a, a young child learning to play the piano and this is uh, both a, po a positive and a negative because on the one hand we know any kind of motor activity a baby's trying to do as he or she tries to grasp a rattle or a glass or anything there's a huge amount of mental effort involved in getting that hit and for those uh, networks to be connected and for that to become automated and of course exactly the same procedure is happening when you're learning to play the piano and so of course something that always preoccupies me is the fact that we say children play inexpressively because indeed a lot of mental attention is involved in just it's like me playing the piano you know getting the notes down and concentrating so hard and so, if you like, there's not the mental space to be considering these expressive communicative, communicative elements. But then sometimes there are techniques you can use in, um, in music teaching to get at this expressive knowledge or in fact communicate this knowledge about these cultural rules and regulations we have about musical expression to children, like singing or using indeed their bodies to dance out the music. Okay, and then of course, consider the traces laid down by an expert pianist. I'm using pianists a lot in my examples here because that's not the main focus of my research, but it's where I've done most of the measuring in the research I've done. And these are not simple ergonomic exercises in, you know, the angle of the arm and using the most economical space. And indeed, um, Caroline's done research on this with the fingers as well. So, of course, you want the best possible results in terms of energy output and accuracy and so on. But clearly, there's something else going on as you play with expression. And I want to just uh, dig into that a little bit and point back to some very important work that was done by Henry Schaffer in the 1970s and 80s. And of course, this was before the advent of the marvellous digital piano. And he was pretty much working on the basis of the kind of light sensor piano interface of the kind that, Henry, um, that um, Seashaw had been developing much earlier. And of course, Henry Schaffer did some very nice experiments where he was looking at the kind of timing profiles people did as they were typing. And what he discovered was that each one of us has an expressive timing profile for the number of key presses we need to make for a specific word. So Isabel would have a particular timing profile for a particular word and I would have a similar timing profile, but it would be unique to me, and so on and so forth. So we've got something unique about a particular configuration of things we're trying to achieve, and in the case of typing, it's almost that there's very little expressive element there,
but there's an expression of your capacity to profile that, that timing profile. And so it was considered that when you were looking at musical expression, it was something that you were doing beyond that. And uh, as you probably all know, there were then subsequently lots of experiments done on timing expression and what was happening on the onset and the offset of a musical note and how that was being played. So um, these were ideas that I was coming to, I was arriving at doing my research very much with this model of what was being expressed and what was beyond the actual biomechanics of accurate note playing. And as we all know, pianists do indeed fill musical time with these kinds of gestures. That's not a terribly objective statement to say they fill musical time, but we all know that that's what seems to be going on. Okay. So what I would like to do now is take you through a series of studies that uh, I went through and a series of mental processes I went through that I think are quite important, um, particularly looking now when so much research seems to have been undertaken. And sometimes I would like people to step back and just think, why am I doing this? And, and what's the point of, of this research? So my very first question I asked was, how on earth can I access what is going on in somebody's mind so that I have some idea of what they're trying to play and how can I try to access that as a perception experiment? How do I know from looking at a performer as well as listening to him or her what they're intending to do? So I thought the easiest way to do that, and in fact this was before Ed Carteret um, and Roger Kendall did some research they did where they got performers to play with different expressive intentions. I thought the easiest thing to do was indeed ask a performer to have a specific expressive intention and see how they generated that through the musical devices they employed, but also through their body. How did that come out through the body? And um, I used just three conditions. One was to play deadpan. I didn't give them any instructions like, you've got to do something with your body. I just said, I would like you to play this piece that you know very well, but in a deadpan manner. You interpret that to be whatever you like. Then I would like you to play a normal performance, as if you were playing in a concert. And then I would like you to exaggerate those features of the performance and see what happens. Now, I did that in a number of different contexts, but the, the little paper that was published was about four violinists. Each violinist played uh, a different piece of music. They all played a short excerpt. And what I did was, of course, a nice, uh, you know, um, repeated measures study in that everybody was seen doing everything and heard doing everything and these little clips were all jumbled up so they were all seen and heard in random order and so what we had was each performer playing in three different manners deadpan normal or exaggerated and then there were four modes of observation uh, three modes of observation i don't know where i got four sound only sound and vision combined and vision only. Ah, I know what the fourth mode is and it, it's one that wasn't used in the publication although it appears in my thesis because at the time it was rather difficult for me to try and normalize this but I did actually dub sound to vision and these were in point lights so they were like motion capture displays so all you saw was the movement you didn't see any of those other social uh, carriers of information like hair, like my annoying hair at the minute going in in my eye. Um, so all those things were removed. And then the other important thing with this study was that there were both musicians and non-musician raters. And when I say non-musicians, these were all journalism students. So they were actually all postgraduate students and they all you know, completed a little form saying that they had never learned a classical music instrument themselves, they'd never been to a classical performance. So if you like, they were kind of naive in how a classical violinist might play or sound, and they didn't listen to classical music. So that's what I was calling a non-musician in this context. The musicians uh, were um, indeed music students, both undergraduate and postgraduate. 
And so what did I find? Well, of course, over time, people have done variations on this experiment and uh, some of them have been supervised by Marcelo. And indeed, the other day in Toronto, I was listening to some results that were a little bit at odds with some of these. But given the context and given the task they were set, I discovered the following. It was very easy to discriminate between these intentions that were being communicated either in sound only, sound or vision and vision only, and they could be communicated even when somebody was playing a very different piece of music, um, and all they needed was that uh, instruction to try and vary the, the interpretation in some way. The mat musical material was remaining constant, but we as perceivers could differentiate between those uh, looking in either one of these modes. However, the non-musicians were very much more reliant on the visual information than the musicians. Now, there could be some reasons for that because different people have subsequently either agreed with that, those findings or they've come to some uh, disagreement where they've found that people are better in rating the sound only. Um, and that's why I want to move on to this second study. I can't actually remember now chronologically if this was the second study I did, but this is the uh, one I'm going to tell you about. So then I thought, OK, so I know that perceptibly and that if you give somebody an instruction, objectively, people do things that are differently. They're doing things that are different in the way in which they're assembling this uh, performance through their body. So I want to measure that. I want to have an objective measure. And of course, for most of you now, thinking about using motion capture, well, that's the obvious first point of call. But at this point, it absolutely was not. And the only technique available to me was to video, have my video stimulus, and then to use physical markers with a very simple X and Y axis on a graph. And I had to track in real time the performer as he moved. And so I was on a sampling rate of video images, 50 per second. So I decided that I couldn't possibly do that many. It would have taken me 10 years to track him. <laughs> so I did every fifth of a second I had a data point. And I, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you because I can't quite remember the, the sequencing, but I, I did markers in a, a range of different locations on his body. And I indeed asked him to play with the three different intentions. And what I wanted to know was quantitatively was the more or less movement in these different manners, okay? And um, what I discovered was that in the deadpan, there was indeed a tendency to sit stiller. And in the projected or the normal performance, well, there was movement. And this was statistically different from deadpan. And then in the exaggerated, there was indeed more movement, but it wasn't statistically different from the ordinary projected performance. So it is as if one can remove some of these uh, characteristics of what you might be calling the things that you add to expression. So there would be variations in timing, in variations in uh, loudness and so on. And this is, of course, communicated in, in and through your body. OK, I don't think there's anything else. So at a certain point, quantitatively, you can see that there wasn't any difference between the projected and the exaggerated performance, although in fact, there was a perceptual difference, but in terms of the quantity of movement being generated, that wasn't different. So, OK, let's now move on to the second question. Are there areas of the performer's body that contain more or less of this information about the performance intention? Well, my answer here is, again, yes. And this is where I link back to the previous study, because in the different areas of the body I measured, I, of course, am looking at a pianist and I'm measuring hands, hand movements. The hands are playing exactly the same piece of music. And of course, they are constrained by the keys that they've got to press and so on. But also there is this free element where the pianist might choose to bring his hand away or leave his hand held up or keep the hands very close to the key. 
But indeed, with this piece, what I discovered was, in this little Beethoven bagatelle, um, there was so much hand movement going on, because it was going at a quaver pace, that people were confusing perceptually this notion of musical expression with amount of movement, which is, of course, a nice balancing act anyway. And I think any of us who work in the applied area of teaching will know that people move more or less and at a certain point there is perhaps too much movement or, or whatever. So we can, we can come back to that one. So then I thought, well, it's important to know which specific area of the body is giving me the crucial information I know to discriminate between deadpan, projected and exaggerated. Is everybody with me? Yeah? Sorry, I'm looking directly into people's faces, probably thinking, oh my God, what's she doing looking at me? But anyway. No. Um, so in this little point light reduction study, what I did was, so I'm sure you all know what point lights are, but for those of you, just in case you don't know, again, this was very high technology at the time. So you had your video camera and you altered the aperture of the video camera, so you opened it right up, so bright light shining into it uh, was the dominant uh, message being sent to the camera. And you had your performer wearing, it's all very kinky, wearing dark clothing with bicycle reflector tape on the crucial joints of the body that you're going to measure. And then you shine a spotlight onto them, and with the aperture adjusted as it is, all you record is the blobs of light moving, okay? And that's the bit that you can look at. So um, I had been inspired in this work by very important research that had been done by uh, initially Gunnar Johansson in the early 1970s and then later somebody called Sverker Runison and then um, more recently uh, somebody called James Cutting who was walk uh, working in gate perception. And what they had done is they had been looking at uh, people walking and wondering how it is that we can see somebody at a huge distance and without being able to see any identifying features of them, we nonetheless can know who it is. Yeah, if we're familiar with that person and they might be 200, 300, 400 metres away, but we still know who they are by the style of their walking. So what Cutting had done was he had done a point light reduction experiment where he'd had people walk towards the camera and he'd systematically reduced all the uh, points of light from full display down and down and down. And he discovered that with only one ankle band on that you could, if you knew who you were looking at, you could recognize that person. So I tried something uh, like that and I discovered that indeed the only information you needed to uh, determine this difference between deadpan, normal and exaggerated, and I did this of course looking at all modes to make sure things weren't going wrong with my study, um, and it was the opening from uh, Mussorgsky's picture at an exhibition with a very, very fine pianist actually. And uh, I discovered that actually the markers, the only thing we needed to get this information was just one marker here. That was it. This was determining and telling me what kind of uh, expressive intention the performer had. And then uh, I did a verification study of that by uh, having the visual, full visual display on a monitor and then closing off part of the monitor. So you could just see, f and I used two second excerpts um, because there'd been research precedents using that amount of time to get a good perceptual judgment. And so you would see something like this and you would have to assess what performance manner it is or you would see the hands and so on. And again, I found that people were very good at doing this, exper this experiment, apart from the confusion over the hands. There was confusion about the actual quantity of activity going on in the hands. So that was telling me something about, although there are perhaps lower orders of very similar expression information coming through, because you are actually generating the, finally the performance it, at the fingertips in the pianist, it is indeed perhaps this information that's giving you more about the mental intention. Or clearer, anyway, perceptual, perceptually clearer. 
Okay. Oh, I just thought I just did that bit, didn't I? No. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Right. I'm just clarifying in my own head. So within that, so what we've got so far is we know there's a quantifiable difference between these different intentions of playing. We know that this information is all that we need in order to determine what that expressive difference is. But once one starts to look in a very detailed and systematic manner, as indeed we do now and as indeed you're looking at me, we know that there are all these micro movements going on that we might consider to be gestures. So uh, there was no way of avoiding this. I had to tackle this particular issue and so started in very detailed manner through systematic observation of the three different performance manners, going back to the Beethoven Bagatelle, getting musician observers to watch in great detail because they were skilled at looking at performers and saying, right, here is an expressive moment and it's coming up and the performer is doing blah, yeah? And so I got these very, very fine-grained descriptions and I actually had six experts do this and then I looked at interrater reliability and I checked all the starts and finishes of these expressive moments and so on. And then I mapped these against the actual performance data. I'm going to show you a slide of this in a, a little moment. But then I asked the question, well, if there is such a thing as an expressive repertoire of particular gestures, so it might be this, or it might be this, or it might be this, do they appear over time? Do they appear in the same piece in the same place? And of course, what I found was both yes and, well, not of course, but I found both yes and no. So I got the same pianist to play the same piece, the little Beethoven Bagatelle, six months later, many times, but I actually sort of uh, measured two of the performances. And then he played several other works as well, including some C.P. Bach, some Brahms, and some Schoenberg. So stylistically, within classical music, but quite different styles. And what I noticed was that indeed he had what you might consider to be a fixed repertoire of movements to him. His repertoire of expressive movements, which were indeed things like this. He would do this with his back, so he'd sit at the piano, and he would go like this. And I, I was trying desperately to look for something that was mapping onto the musical structure. Was it when he started a new phrase? Well, indeed, it was very often when he started a new musical idea, he would do this with his back across all these pieces, but sometimes it wasn't. Sometimes he would just have his hand going on some scalic runs that would be going for ages in the CP bark, and he would do this movement as well. Or um, the other ones, we'll see some of them coming up, the head nodding, and pushing away from the keyboard and swaying. Or these kind of rotational hand lifts that they would vary from dipping the hand way below the key to lifting the hand very high or coming and hold it. He would do this sometimes as well, hold his hands like this. So I had recognized a vocabulary of movements used by this guy, but the meaning of them, the specific semantics of them, I wasn't getting clear access to. I knew there was a relationship with what he was trying to do with a musical structure, but it wasn't a one-on-one -on -one mapping. Okay? And again, there was another uh, issue there about another observation I made was, of course, the more engaged he was in key playing, the, the, so the more notes per second, if you like, um, the less time he had to do expressive things with his hands, of course, and the more that this information was again being contained in the upper body. <clears throat> so, to the, and, oh, okay, so that's where we are with that. So then there was a, a further level to this. What happens if he hasn't got the feedback from the instrument? Does he still generate the sounds using the body in the same way? Is this some kind of feedback loop? Is he reacting to the sounds? Because I think most of us observe when we watch someone playing, you sometimes see them make a gesture and they seem as though they're reacting to the sound they've created. So 
if that feedback loop's broken down, does he still make the same movement? So I gave him this uh, opportunity to play these pieces in the same way, but without oral feedback. And of course, he did indeed do similar movements. The movements, by the way, were happening at consistent structural moments. They were things like starts and stops of phrases. They were to do with uh, phrase peaks and so on. Um, but the way in which those movements per se, those little identifiable movements were being used was in a very open manner. So in one interpretation, he might be doing a high hand lift. In another, he might be doing the, another. And these were now on repeated performances of just asking him to play the piece as if he were in a concert and expressively. And then I did a crazy thing. I got him to uh, do these just on a tabletop. I said, OK, let, play these pieces for me uh, without a piano and what happens. And of course, he still made all these little expressive movements as well, even though his hands were in a completely false position. OK, then um, I'm sort of moving on in time now. And I actually had a student, an undergraduate student, who was doing his honours project with me. And he's a very fine pianist and also a composer. And we thought it would be fun for him to try. I mean, there are problems with this study, but nonetheless, it's got a nice little quirk to it. Um, it would be interesting for him to give some performers analogous tasks to undertake to see if you learn in a condition that doesn't enable you to use your body freely, what happens with the amount of uh, expressive intention you can put into the performance. Of course, this is problematic because it's going against what your habit strength is. But they were allowed to practice uh, for a long time over this. And he composed two pieces using the same musical material, but kind of inverted it and did all kinds of stuff. So there were two separate pieces, but the same requirements in terms of what he was they were being asked to do with the music. And um, in one set of circumstances, the individual would learn the piece free. They would just learn the piece. It was only over a two octave range, so there was nothing to make them move from pretty much sitting still. And in the other, they would be asked to sit completely still. And they, they had to sit against, I mean, it wasn't too terrible. We weren't tied up or anything, but they had to sit with their back. They had to sit in their normal piano position and they had a, a kind of metal pole at the back of the piano stool and they were asked not to move from that and then they could practice in this. And so, as I say, a little bit problematic, but nonetheless, it gave us some very nice results. So when the people were in the very constrained uh, sitting position and then they were rated by observers watching and listening to them playing, they found these performances less expressive than when they were free. Well, OK, what does that show us? Well, again, I think it has some implications, although there are little problems with the design. OK, so points of special notes, I think. The persistence of the gestures for the individual, and I've done this now over several individuals because it's incredibly time consuming. But indeed, people have repertoires of identifiable movement gestures that they use time and again when they're playing. And the other thing that I think is crucial I want to talk to you about is this notion of the body sway. Now, I picked up on an idea that um, I've not got the uh, scientific nous, if you like, to, to develop this any further. But I do think, theoretically, it is quite a nice idea. And this, again, came from James Cutting, who was talking about the walkers. And he argued that in a physical physics sense, there is a center of moment around which the body moves that defines the expression of, if you like, gender. So you can tell somebody's walking pattern because of a fulcrum not related to your center of gravity, but related to how all your limbs move around this center that gives you that information about your your uh, gender. And of course, that's hugely variable. And you can try and fake that. And there are people who will be at more one extreme and, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, 
this was there. And the more I thought about the swaying action with piano playing at least, and uh, what we can discuss this and we can talk about in other instrumental contexts, of course, what you have on the piano stool is the fulcrum of the hips. And so any movement you're making has to be generated from here. Even if you're sitting pretty still, as soon as you move, you're using this area. And uh, from long and repeated observations and measurements of people, um, I think that this is a, a very vital source of information and interaction with your instrument. And it doesn't really matter if you're a cellist or, you know, well, again, we can talk about that. Okay, so um, I wanted to try and tie the swaying more clearly and in a more direct fashion to musical structure. So Eric Clark and I um, did a little study, which you can't really see here, but it's the little uh, Chopin E minor prelude, which I think most of you will know. And what we did was we, uh, we looked, at, we did a, a more standard kind of, um, you know, Henry Schaffer uh, MIDI data capture of expressive timing profiles. And we also aligned this with what was going on in the head movement. And so we have here two different interpretations of this piece. And what you can see is that in the first one, the piece reaches this kind of big crescendo as the, re the, the work comes to its climax there, bar 16, 17, and 18. And, but the, the swaying movement keeps pretty constant, and it's kind of going across and has a relationship to the measure, but it's not particularly aligned directly to the musical structure. And I can show you some interpretations by different performers. And then the other thing we've got on here are these little sort of inverted arrows, the little arrows pointed down, and they are when there were identifiable gestures that the guy was making, either this back wiggling or whatever. And then in this interpretation, what we see here is a bigger dynamic variation and this huge blip in tempo. At the, he ac accelerates really hugely here at the climax of the piece. But then what you see with the body is it's much stiller and slowing down towards the end. Now, we interpreted those differences as two different structural readings of that piece of music, one with it becoming a sort of A2 a form and the other being a much more through composed uh, realisation of the musical structure. And, and we talked about that at length. And in some ways, that was good to see the link between the musical dynamics and what was happening with the body, but it wasn't as uh, rigidly bound together as I, I was hoping. Um, just as an aside, you may be wondering why I'm not showing you lots of musical examples. This is because in 2008, when I relocated to Australia, all my life's possessions were on a cargo container that ended up at the bottom of the ocean. So I, I haven't shown you examples because I no longer have any of the data. Um, but what we'll do for fun is I've just taken randomly off YouTube four different interpretations of that little uh, Chopin prelude. So uh, we'll just watch a few seconds of each one and we can maybe use this for discussion later. <laughs> That's enough. You get the idea. You can see that little sway, and you can see on those little leading notes in the melody the way he moves forward. Okay, next one. Quite different interpretations as well, but you see the same effect happening. So it's partially a technical thing of lying into the piano, but there's also this sense of her generating this uh, motion as well, this circular swaying motion.
It's hilarious because they're in people's houses. It just makes me laugh. Or in their studio or something with a fancy ball gown. So you see in her, it's a bit more up, but it's the same effect. And then somebody who's much stiller, but again, you see the same effect of, if you like, lifting the phrase over. Watch, the, the motion for him comes in his arms. There you go. That's enough. Okay. Sorry, I've got like a million things that I can go on and on about. You'll have to tell, I'm aware of the time, but... Okay, so we know that these individuals, in terms of uh, this kind of musical performance at least, have a repertoire of movements which is unique to that individual, and that these are indeed governed by socio-cultural rules, and I'm sure that you've all seen schools of piano playing where people make similar gestures and where I used to work at the University of Sheffield we had a fantastic violin teacher who used to get all her students to stand like that with their legs apart knees bent and every time they would make a down bow they would bend their knees and so of course there are these things being commu communicated as well and um, the mapping from the gestural signals to meaning is an important human survival skill but of course the more specialized the gestural language that you're using, the more insider knowledge is required to decode that. So the difference between that and that, for, it, for instance. And I've been fascinated by that because I've been looking at 17, early 17th century opera and some of the gestures they used to make were absolutely incredible, the emblematic sign, you know, signals they were sending. Okay, so how can we uh, look at these uh, socio-cultural factors and the meaning of these particular individual gestures and how, uh, how are we going to look at those in musical performance? Well, of course, we can hazard a guess at what the musical language is eliciting. And um, I thought that a nice way forward for me with this was to look at the nonverbal communication that goes on in, in verbal communication. So I had a strong tie to a narrative that I could understand in a very uh, easy way. And uh, Bill Thompson last week was speaking in Toronto and he was talking about the work he'd been doing on facial expression. And of course, they, facial expressions do have strong signal, signaling qualities, but sometimes they offer cues, unintentional cues that we misread as well. And um, we, what we tend to do is we offer up these connotations. So a chain of signs give us a platform for meaning. And he was using that in, in uh, musical performance, linking it with speech and singing and the kinds of expressions you put on your face there. And of course, the other thing that I, I want to put in there is of course, the, the idea of the movement of the music would then be connected to a kind of emotional state that you're seeing somebody uh, projecting through their body. And uh, of course, this is an analogy has been used. People have talked about it like Peirce and Umberto Eco and various people. So that you ally this to a kind of style of person. So a slow person's a non-energetic person. So slow music is sad and unenergetic and so on and so forth. So we're pulling on all these things. And if indeed we're generating the performance through our body, there is a, clearly a connection there. Okay, so what I'm going to, I'm going to be quick, as quick as I can now. I just want to tell you about a little study that uh, was undertaken along with a master's student. And some of these things are, are not to my taste, but it's her taste, so that's fine. Um, we looked at Liszt's Liebestraum. And uh, we, I, I thought it was a good choice because it's got a very strong um, verbal narrative as well. And it's based on a song, Oh Love, As Long As You Can Love. So a highly romantic notion. The poem expresses the all-conquering power of love and kindness. Um, why I was also uh, interested in doing this was I wanted to take this right outside of the um, laboratory and I just wanted to again to look at good old YouTube 
and I wanted a public performance, a high level, international level public performance. What does somebody really do and what are they doing with their face and their body as they're trying to uh, express this particular narrative? And of course, uh, they're not ideal because it's not fixed camera like you can obtain in an experiment. Uh, and some of this, as you will see, goes in and out of focus off the face to other parts of the hands, for instance. Um, but it was, we had to select some moments from the piece. Uh, and again, I don't want to go on at length because I've got other things I want to say. But basically, we looked at the opening, the climax of the piece in terms of its intensity and then the return to the opening section and the first part of the coda. And all we did was we did repeated observations. We selected my students, two favourite pianists, and somebody said to me, my God, what a very odd choice. Um, but that doesn't matter. That's her taste and that's human nature. We, we like different people and different things. I could see a little bit of a connection. Uh, Lang Lang and Evgeny Kissin have both come through that Russian school of piano teaching. Uh, Lang Lang in the post Second World War, uh, as we all know, the Russians became a very strong influence in classical music uh, teaching. They both started international careers very, very young. And the crucial thing is they both play the Liebestraum often as an encore. So it's their party piece. It's a piece they know very well. And if you choose to, it is again worth having a look on YouTube because there are some fabulous different contexts where Lang Lang is playing this piece. And there's one where he's playing it in a shopping centre and there's nobody taking much notice of him. And he plays it in a very different manner to what we're going to see now. So what I'm going to do is just show you a little bit of the data. And so what I was looking at was what's happening, what are the signals coming through the face, what kinds of gestures are they? How do they link to the overall gesture? And how do they link to this clear narrative coming out of the music or the verbal narrative? So you can see again some of this kind of stuff. Lots of raised eyebrows. Some breathing. Little mouth thing happening. But as you see, very controlled around the hands. There's nothing much happening all over the place with the hands. want to stop it in a sensible place. And here's our friend Lang Lang. Very different person as you can see by his energy level. <coughs> so again you see the rotational sway. And whatever's happening here is all part and parcel of the same energy. So the intimacy of the sound is getting closer. And again, there's a lot of eyebrow stuff happening as well. OK, so.
So, of course, there's a disadvantage now in that I'm showing you uh, frozen snapshots. And of course, the, the movements are dynamic and uh, they're moving all the time, they're not static. But um, I just want to show you a few little areas where we identified uh, where they were landing on an expressive gesture, if you like, and what was going on in the face. So here you see uh, that Kisin, as he comes onto this uh, held sea, is raising his, uh, sort of furrowing his brow and raising this kind of expression. And Lang Lang is doing something along the same kind of line. We see them both at this point as they play these three ascending crotchets, moving kind of back from the keyboard. And we see what Lang Lang does as his reaction as he squashes down and opens his mouth as he hits this chord here, this kind of uh, reaching a kind of resolution into that chord. Now, as we reach the climax of the piece, Kisin sits very still and he's getting this huge weight of energy behind him. And Lang Lang is going more and more into the keyboard. And this is very funny, especially if I play them in very fast sequence, which I won't do, but you get the idea. He hits the high chord and then watch what happens next. It's hilarious. <laughs> so, um, okay, anyway, I think we've all got... And then he reacts to that as he's coming down here. Kisin sits very much more still. And uh, then we get these very different expressions, okay. So if we describe what's going on, what we see is we get furrowing and lifting of the whole of the eyebrows. We get the mouth opening and closing, breathing in fact, and the eyes very much open and then closed. And Kisin has got one of these nervous blinks, so he does this a lot when he's playing as well. And um, they're quite limited in the variety of what he does, and they're fairly consistent at these structural moments, he will do something. And his most distinctive thing was the eyebrows. Uh, he did do some swaying, but it's mainly in this direction, away from the keyboard with this kind of stiff upper uh, body. So his movements same, seem to both align with a moment as he plays it and mirror structural events. Sometimes he'll hit a chord and then it's like he'll listen to it and react to it. Lang Lang uses the frowning, the lifting, and all that stuff of the eyebrows. And he's often looking into the distance. So quite a different thing going on for him. And uh, his eyes are either relaxed or very tense and open. He does a lot with his mouth, protruding his lips, pulling these expressions, and uh, lots with the cheeks sometimes in this kind of crying gesture and sometimes smiling. And he uses this rotational sway and he uses these very high uh, hand lifts. So if we look at what's going on in the narrative of the, the story behind this music, if nothing else, um, it, what strikes us through these observations is that Kisin is much more focused on the musical tension and relaxation of playing and in real time anticipating hitting and reacting to the sound he's generating uh, rather than kind of trying to act out and live the emotions. Um, there is narrative content but it, if you like it's contained within the music whereas Lang Lang is playing this out as well as he's doing the musical task but he's also playing out the expression of the piece. So the piece comes to a climax so his body does a huge climax as well. So we're coming towards the end, but where does this leave us? Well, it brings me more into kind of social psychology research I've been doing for some time now on singers because indeed these codes are so directly uh, linked to what they're communicating with their nonverbal gestures that come from their well-practiced speech in song. And uh, there's a whole uh, repertoire of, of things I could go into here. I want to show you um, a piece of uh, data that I, I wrote, um, I, I have to tell you that this research began by me doing some analysis, I'm an opera singer, and I did some analyses of my own performances, but then I put this into this particular popular domain because there was so much going on socially 
with the audience as well. But for now, let's just look at what Annie Lennox is doing, not what the audience is doing. It's just a brilliant example of extremely good professional show performance, really. So a few things you should notice. First of all, this kind of relaxed hand she's got here. She's acknowledging the audience, of course. She's talking about the narrative of the song, Cooler. And then she comes back to this, now emblematic, showing the sun on her chest. She's going to illustrate now how the dumb hearts get broken, just like China Cup, so the emotional intention. Watch again, she goes back to this more relaxed. See this? Now she's playing with her audience now, which is a very nice tool. They all know what's coming next. Just one thing, she's back in the narrative of the song. And now she's going to coordinate a band in a minute. So every time she's signaling just, and now in comes the band. So again, conducting the band. So you see there are several things going on with the gestures. They're serving several functions. She's doing this kind of reflecting, tell me, and then reflecting it. She's telling you the narrative of the story. She's using illustrative gestures. She's using some emblematic gestures as well. And then she's using these things that are called adaptive gestures. There's a funny bit in a moment. I mean, of course, this is cut by somebody. So. So at the moment, she's staying in the narrative of the song. Your careless notions have silenced these emotions. Back onto this illustrative thing. Now watch what happens. Let's forget the song completely. Oh yeah, let's everybody sing the chorus and come on everybody join in. So, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. So what she's doing, I, I think it's a really nice illustration of she's playing all different kinds of roles in there. She's the diva communicating with her audience, playing these social games of you know what I'm going to sing or you've got a good chance. Let's have a slow intro. I'm going to sing the first word and then I'm dramatically going to go and turn away from you and you might know what's coming next. So she's setting up all these expectations. Then, as I say, she shows us the narrative of her song. And of course, emblematic ones are the ones that we need to decode from very strong, you know, uh, cultural knowledge. Um, but the thing that I, I think is important, the more I look at this kind of work, are these kinds of things that are our adapter gestures. And quite a lot of you are doing it now. You're going like this, somebody else sitting like this. And they're these gestures that we all make that just check us out. We'll make sure we're still there. <laughs> they're kind of those gestures of reassurance. And for me, I have subsequently done some studies where I've looked at singers of different uh, styles of music singing the same repertoire and working with accompanists. And what I find is that if there isn't some of these adapter gestures in the communication between the two people in rehearsal, and then some of that doesn't appear in the performance, the performance is regarded by the audience as being false. So you don't really get a sense of who the person inside is. Do you see what I mean? So this natural inner state of the person. And of course, well, we haven't got time to do this now. I'm going to have to stop. But the other thing I want to say about that is that this definitely has something to do with proxemics. So proxemics is how far you are away from the person you're interacting with. And if I'm in a big public space, of course I have to make a bigger public gesture to kind of contact you. And what you see in the kind of Annie Lennox thing is you see these different layers of distance. 
And what she's showing you as well is intimacy. She's showing you the intimate space. Now, how that maps onto the pure, uh, the pure music without the narrative of the, uh, the, the words and uh, a, a clear indication of what that musical structure is meaning to us, I think is something along the same lines. So when we see Lang Lang making these very intimate expressions, well, some of them may seem a little bit uh, difficult to look at, or they may seem that you have a sense of how intimate the music is. And then, of course, some of it is very much more show-oriented, like the list. Um, now, I am going to wrap there, but I have done quite a lot of research on social interaction between players. And uh, one of the most interesting studies I've done is I have in process uh, a piano duet study with twins. They're Korean girls who moved to Australia when they were 14, but they both play the piano exceptionally well, and they come into one another's space very easily. So when they sit down, they've played lots of duets, and they come down to play, it's almost like they're one person right from the start. They come into this movement and the groove together, and they know the rules of intimacy between them. And a few years ago, I did a similar study with two guys who had never played together before, and just watching that process of them coming into this very tight shared physical space to generate quite an expressive performance uh, raised lots of issues and they eventually the key to what happened over time they practiced they did about five uh, they did five sessions of about two hours practice each time and the thing that increased over time was the capacity to actually dare to look at one another and then they eventually got that they could feel comfortable about crossing over their hands and so on so i think proxemics has quite a lot uh, to offer us, of course, in that context I'm just talking about, but also as a kind of metaphor for explaining what the music is doing. Is it pulling us into a very quiet, intimate space, or is it projecting us out into a very big uh, public space? So I think I'm going to draw the line there. So I think what I've tried to show you is how I began my research with very simple questions, making objective measures, and as time has gone by, because I'm somewhat limited in, in my own uh, technical knowledge and experience, I've become fascinated by what these social elements bring to the performance in terms of how we make that meaningful, not only to the audience, but to ourselves. It's almost like we're, um, we're playing the piece with our, with our bodies and our gestures and our ideas about uh, social relationships, if you like. Okay, I think I'll finish there.